So the Nordic success of documented tale was also a sign that the Nordic art system somehow had matured. There was a magazine. There were curator, director types like Marita Jaukuri, Osman Torkelsen, Gertrud Sandqvist and Lars Nitve, who had gained international positions. And there was, importantly, new museums for contemporary art in, uh, amongst other places, Oslo and Helsinki. But one could also uh, sense at this time that this was perhaps an intermediate stop, uh, a success with an expiry date, so to say. It was as if Sixi and the art scene was waiting for something else. In the fall the same year, Jon Peter Nilsson comes back from Documenta and reports, Documenta 9 explodes the structures of the 80s. It's not a summing up, but a suggestion. The initial feeling of confusion is a direct encouragement to the viewer to dare to trust his, her own reactions, not to be afraid of what is strange, the other. Documenta 9 is a stopping off place where we can draw breath so as not to be overtaken by progress. Thus, when a hegemony is established, there will be a counter movement. And signs of a new generation, which in due time shall form its own hegemony, is present in the same year, in the last issue of 1992. Here, uh, Tom Sandqvist discovers the art of Carl Holmqvist. He'd been a regular contributor to Sixty for a couple of years, actually, so he was already an insider. But nevertheless, uh, he, he got the experienced critic and theorist to somehow drop his guard and describe something that was completely new. It's, it's a casual breakthrough, right on the button. Nothing was made explicit, despite the systematicness. Nothing except a slightly ironic humor. Nothing is any longer capable of gathering itself into a definitive truth. Everything revolves around the banal, which refuses to conform to the adult demands of the symbolic system. Here we reach the real shift in the art of the early 90s. The documenta generation had somehow, somehow taken in the crisis of modernism, but they had nevertheless managed to forge a place for the coherent art object, object in that world of crisis. This was perhaps their success. Carl Holmquist and the generation of the 90s that followed him rejected this coherence and let the crisis show in their work in a very different way. At least this goes for part of the 90s seen in the Nordic countries. And it is Karl Holmquist himself, this time the writer, that in 1993 presents the aforementioned Rirkli Tiravanisha as one of these new hero fig figures. He writes that he's been served real cooked food by the New York based artist Rirkli Tiravanisha, both as a performance and he's also experienced at as part of installations. And he says that Tiravanisha is used to conditions that are hard to control. Whatever happens, happens. More than anything, a sense of realness is the quality of the work. There are no words for this new aesthetic yet, but it's described as a sense of realness, uh, perhaps in opposition to the artist that had recently been, been shown at Documenta. The signs of this new generation uh, had been present on the margins in 60 since the beginning of the decade. That is, hidden away somehow in the reviews section. That's often where you find the most interesting stuff in art magazines, isn't it? Already in 1990, Paul Eric Toyner writes the following about the seminal exhibition Luxury Culture at Sophie and Holm in Copenhagen. The pervasive theme throughout the exhibition is the experience of culture as scenography, as absence music, as stylized production of symbols. Diametrically opposite to that very ironic and intense kind of appearance which characterized the early part of the 80s. The 90s are apparently determined toward the direction of a more concentrated attitude about what it is to make art, including also the possibility perhaps, of again making political art. It's interesting to note that the writer already here in 1990 talks of the 80s as if it had happened ages ago, 
Uh, and it talks also about the 90s as if it was already a well-established phenomenon. In uh, 1992, uh, there are more of these kind of descriptions. And we're still in Denmark when the artist group Baghuse has an exhibition in Aarhus. Now it's time to open the doors of the museum to the 90s generation. The 80s painters looked mainly to Germany for inspiration, whereas the interest of this group is primarily directed towards the American scene. Their spiritual forefathers are Marcel Duchamp, Andy Warhol, and the 60s pop art. I'm sorry. Their slogans call for work of art which do not invite emotional identification with the artistic personality or aestheticism. So it's, it's this huge gap opening up here between, uh, between these two generations. The next year, Tom Sundquist returns from the Venice Biennial and has experienced a perhaps more mature version of the same tendency. And we shall take note of the focus on the document and the use of the word discursive here, as this is pointing towards another latent tendency that shall gain momentum towards the end of the decade. The aesthetic work vanishes. So we can see this movement. What? First you have the, 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 the still strong art object, then it's somehow littered across the floor or eaten as soup, and now here it vanishes. To the benefit of the document, the record, the report, discursive units that proclaim that the process of investigation has taken place, as when Andrea Sittel builds a set of cages for rearing hens that can fly as part of a critical intervention in the latest developments in biotechnology. So the formal description of the new work is more or less the same with all these uh, writers. The status of the art object is weakened. The same goes for the romantic expressive tendency. The difference comes across then in the reading of the political aspects of the work, where Toyner sees a new political tendency uh, in the neoconceptual and pop-oriented Danish art scene. Uh, Laufe Helgedotter, a Finnish, uh, uh, an Icelandic writer, sees individualism and a continuation of the dissolved value systems of conservative postmodernism. But as I said, Tom Sundquist has discovered that which will be lurking under for the years to come, and that is documentarism, discursive strategies, and a revival of what can perhaps be called actually grand nar political narratives, this time in the shape of globalization and post-colonialism. 1994 was an intermediary year for Sixi. Uh, Timo Valjaka was about to leave his position as editor and several issues focusing on the national art scenes appeared. In the editorial of the Finnish issue, Valjaka stated that Finnish art was formed between, between the opposites of uh, the Apollyon and the Dionysian. The, la the latter, was further explored by Arja Elovirta in an essay called The Grotesque Moment. Mo Moment. Here she launch launches, um, and we can also think of Matthew Barney in this regard, the body as a pivotal theme in the art of the 90s. In an age when the sacred values of religion, work, and morality are undergoing erosion, the human body appears as the laboratory of the ambivalent aspects of selfhood and reality. We need only to think of, say, on Sophie's Ideen or uh, Knut Olstam. Knut Olstam has fallen out of his. To see the relevance of this, uh, this statement, actually. In the issue on Norway, the dual position of prov provincialism and internationalism is discussed once again. In the editorial, Lotte Sandberg in Junova Steihaug speaks of, of a museum boom as well as the many new artist-run spaces in Norway. This discussion about the art institution uh, goes on constantly, but in small notices only in Sixi. They state that the issue, uh, this, this thematic issue, is not about Norwegian painting of a typical Nordic sensibility, so we, it's clear we need to take a distance from that, but about a cultural heterogeneity and globalizing forces at work. But on the other hand, in his story on the Norwegian art scene, Juno Vestaihaug says that this is a people, the Norwegian then, with an identity helplessly trapped between an inferiority complex and national chauvinism. <laughs> 
It's actually quite a good expression. So once again, the discussion of a Nordic identity is caught in a paradox. At this point, it's also important to note that Norway and perhaps Iceland and to a certain extent Finland is lagging behind Denmark and especially Sweden when it comes to the mediators of contemporary art. Steihag writes, a whole stratum of freelance curators, writers, critics and theoreticians is simply not there. This imbalance should shape the Nordic collaborations for years to come. In 1995, I had myself a short stint uh, at the editor's chair at Sixi. Uh, for three issues, uh, I, I, I was uh, editing the magazine, in, waiting for the new editor. And this gave me, I had some experience with magazine production, so it gave me a chance to try to professionalize Sixi as an editorial product with clearer sections, more ads, more elaborate design, and a more active use of images. Uh, but not really the, the, the chance to make a serious imprint on the ideological underpinnings of the magazine, as it were. The establishment of a new, younger art scene in the Nordic countries became, however, the leading subject of the first issue with an interview with the Danish gallerist Nikolai Wallner. This is a project called Burnout, which was in his gallery. He was 23 years old at the time, and the title was Young at Art. Wallner forcefully re rejected the art of the 80s, but his most pointed criticism was directed towards the Danish art institution, who, in his view, did not respond adequately to the new art of the 90s. It's worth noting here that in the mid-90s, this was seen as one thing. The neo-avant-garde tendencies of contemporary art, if you can call it that, it's if it was revolting against the art object and the art institution, and it had a political agenda, it can somehow be called avant-garde. But this tendency was considered at the moment fully compatible with the agenda of the new gallery scene. I think it's not like that anymore, actually. The proximity, even solidarity, between the neo-avant-garde and the young commercial art scene was apparent both in the major gathering of the young Nordic art scene, Art Attack, in Oslo in 1995. There's a picture missing again, doesn't matter. Um, this is one of the galleries, uh, an exhibition much later, but it somehow looks the same. Um, both at Art Attack and at the, the Alternative Art Fair in Stockholm Smart Show, the, the, uh, somehow the slacker art and trash aesthetic was ruling. In his report from Art Attack, Daniel Birnbaum wrote, a raw, somewhat sloppy exterior domina dominates and a bewildering diversity. Later the same year, Birnbaum reported from Smart Show, this trash aesthetic was totally dominant it looks banality right in the eye. One of the leading artists of this young art scene in Oslo, who however quickly matured, was Bjarne Melgor. He is also reviewed for the first time in Sixi in 1995. I think it's in Oblom, I, I didn't have, have the, the right note here. Uh, in a childlike, naive style, which can recall scribblings executed in semi-conscious moments, comic strips and worn-out model sketches are strewn across the gallery. Thus, in reference to these semi-conscious moments, an ideological basis and perhaps a deeper meaning of this trash aesthetic is proposed, something aching perhaps to the kind of truth Sigmund Freud envisioned you could reach laying on the sofa during psychotherapy, semi-consciously speaking of your inner feelings and your history. It's important to note, however, that perhaps a little bit differently from that of the generation of the 80s, this trash or slacker aesthetics also get criticized in 60 right away. It's Rita Roos that takes on the artists of the 90s in issue 2, 1995. The criticism is, however, perhaps not directed at Bjarne Melgård. Perhaps he's actually one of the few that actually will pass the test that she 
that she describes after seeing a lot of what she called neurotic art at Smartshow. The directness and nonchalance become empty gestures if they do not create a situation in which something precisely experienced and lived through enters in. Finally, uh, the last of these nationally oriented issues in 1995 focused on Denmark. Um, here the difference between Denmark and the other Nordic countries are stressed, among other things. Jorten Meyer, the editor, writes that the Danish art scene differs from those of the other Nordic countries. It's geographically and culturally closer to the continent. Perhaps true. I'm not going to dwell too much on this issue, but one thing struck me as I read through it. Um, in the main article entitled Royal Copenhagen, the two writers, Christina Kern and Tone O'Nilsson, observes two tendencies in contemporary Danish art. The first does perhaps correspond with the 80s and late modernism. They describe it as aestheticizing and transcending in its formal expression. It focuses on history, perception, and philosophy of art. The other tendency does perhaps correspond to the 90s. It's extrovert, socially conscious, and personally inquisitive. The interesting part comes, however, when the authors refer to that what they do not see in the contemporary Danish art in the 90s. And that is a political and socially analytical critical art. The only artists they can see that works in this way are Susan Hinnom and Henrik Olsen, in fact. The latter to become one of the leading Danish artists only a few years later, opening a show this month, I think, in Copenhagen early next month, at the X space, at the National Gallery. More important than the mentioning of these single artists is, however, the expressed lack of analytical and critical art. It could also be called institutional critique, and discursive projects. We will soon get back to how this mode of operation enters the Nordic art scene towards the end of the 90s. This gets really interesting very soon, but uh, uh, what, how am I doing in terms of time? Really? Seven. Look, I'm, I'm now going to wait. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit, so just to give you an impression, just dash through the rest of the paper, actually. Some of you will remember, now we're into a new era. Jon Petter Nielsen has taken over the editorial chair. Some of you will remember how Club Berlin, a techno disco come art venue, seemed like such a radical intervention during the Venice Biennial in 1995. This was exactly the, f the, the, the first article in Sixi in 1996 when Jon Peter Nielsen had taken over, written by the German critic Peter Herbstroth. You are part of the atmosphere, Herbstroth writes and you don't oppose it. So the issue of ambience enters into the discourse and Sixi moves in the direction of popular culture. The published story on jungle music, Sex Pistols, DJ Spooky, Force Incorporated, and something called The Birth of the Cool. Grön, Nuna Nisson and the Finnish artists are one of the artists that fit into this new <coughs> idiom and Ina Blom writes, the affective aspects of the time-space fantasy assume particular significance. Lars Bang Larsen writes about Tommy Olsson. This is actually from an exhibition of Tommy Olsson that's up in Oslo now, now, but he writes about his videos in the same experience-oriented way. Tommy Olsson moves beyond kitchen ripoff into a, a visual white noise where personality, body, and media are combined as lived out experience. This is funny. In, no, in issue 396, there's an interview with this guy, Hans Ulrich Ubrist. And it's the first attempt I, I've seen in 60 to historicize and problematize the role of the curator. <coughs> 
And in fact, in the issues to come, several of these curators are portrayed and they take the place of that the American artists had previously being somehow the, the heroes of the story of contemporary art. Utometa Bauer, Katrin David, Okvian Weser and Isabel Carlos are all interviewed. And for these special interviews, Sixi pulls out of the hat that old visual rhetoric of the big black and white photograph portrait. So this was only called from the internet, I'm sorry. Um, so um, this new 90s generation uh, becomes the new hegemony of contemporary Nordic art. Here is a, a, a front page dedicated to Henrik Peng Jakobsen. And part of this is also how at the Nordic Pavilion in 1997, the Nordic countries can invite an American artist to exhibit within the superstructure of, sort of Nordic cultural collaboration. Can you see the sort of shift that's happened here? We can teach them. This is Mark, D Mark Dion, by the way. And the curator, Julova Steihaug, again says, we are looking for something other than the myth that an artist represents a region. Today, art is internationalized in a completely different way than before. This internationalization is everywhere also in Sixi. Joshua Dechter, a US writer, actually has a regular column in Sixi where it so somehow hammered in the fact that at this point in time, the Nordic art scene is seen from the perspective of New York. But New York is not discussed in terms of its regionalism. On the other hand, the Nordic countries are rejected as a region. So this is perhaps one of the criticisms one can direct towards John Peter Nilsson's uh, Sixi. And um, this hegemony is also aesthetic. It, it, it's also about the artists. Lars Bang Larsen about Henrik Plenge Jakobsen. Henrik Plenge Jakobsen knows and utilizes the possibilities at hand in the negotiation between the art institution and current aesthetic and societal debates. Again, we can see sort of a, an academism forming a matured version of institutional critique. This is the new Nordic hegemony, and it's only taken five years to change the art scene. Yeah, Henrik Håkansson. No, Elis Attila is part of this. Henrik Håkansson. Olaf Eliasson. And uh, up comes the exhibition, The Nordic Miracle, in, in, um, in, in Paris. And as I try to be funny here, I write, if the editors of Sixi could have invented Twitter, they would. It was like, all, it was all over the magazine. But each time it was mentioned, it was rejected, of course. The same as Nordic identity, actually, always. Uh, again, uh, somehow, uh, however, and I've given you several pointers, um, even though it's a new sort of hegemony of Nordic art form, something else um, is cooking. And um, we're going to go back to Documenta again, and, and I'm going to quote Katrin David, uh, that somehow prepares the ground for uh, what can be called a discursive turn in contemporary art, and which somehow is opposed to this uh, neo-aestheticism of, of Ola Ferreliasson et company. David says, we are living in a very reactionary moment. I don't believe in the end of history and I don't believe too much in the postmodern. We will extend the aesthetic debate into a broader cultural debate to see globalization from a critical point of view. We are looking for artists who work with a radical critique of the very foundations of culture. That's me. Seen in the light of, of Sixi's uh, very recent rhetoric of ambience and subversion and Jon Petter Nilsson's statement only one year previously that history has already happened. He says, this is perhaps a wake-up call uh, for Sixi. Um, 
and later that year in 1997, there's a, a, a certain historical figure that shows up in 60, and I've now flipped through all the issues since 1986, and I think it's the first time he's mentioned, and you know who, who this is? Uh, Karl Marx. <laughs> Eight page feature on Karl Marx. And it is a German, German writer, and he says, he says, some of Marx's analy analysis, which has been out of fashion earlier in this decade, might only now be realized to their full extent. That's perhaps putting it a bit strongly, but it, it points in a very strong direction, both for the, the art world and for Sixty, which turned into new in 1999. Another editor came on. It was a continuation of this new Nordic hegemony. In parallel, they started doing thematic issues on the alternative art scene. And they kept on focusing on what can be done with the political turn or the discursive turn. But it was never quite resolved uh, within the editorial concept. Ah, here's Documenta. Uh, here's Manifesta. Here's the last issue of Sixty with the Finnish uh, artist group. Uh, Love Corporation, Atlantic Love Corporation. It's almost going to say there's sugar cubes, but. Um, it closes down. Uh, yeah, it turns into new. <laughs> it closes down for some months and, 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 and re emerges in 1992. And the Swedish artist Annika von Hauswolf, sorry, is once again actually, I think it's the third time, on the front page and gets a write up. Uh, as if it was 1995. In addition, she gets a 10-page a project in this issue. It seems actually rather empty. And the same goes perhaps for the project by the Norwegian artist Erik Snedsbörl, who gets sort of a, too much space for himself in this issue. For the last time here, the Nordic art magazine rehearsed the discussion about Nordic identity. The editors cite Douglas Copeland as they try to make the financial problems of the magazine into a class issue. Douglas Copeland, in, he says, when you're, and they quote, they quote him, when you're middle class, history will ignore you. It does not matter how much you try. History happens elsewhere. The last section of the magazine, of the last issue, before it closed down in 2002, it's actually wrong in my, that which is in your program, the last section, which used to be uh, rich on reviews, where you can, if you couldn't like the rest of the content, you could always find something in the reviews section, right? It used to be rich on reviews from all over the world. Uh, it's now imploded into a section called, not new reviews, but it was called un. Not new, but un. It contains no reviews, but rather reflections on criticality, printed in very small letters, actually. There are three articles, one by Kim West, one by Maria Lin, and one by Nicola Borio. It's really a, a lame excuse for a review section, but it could actually have been a really good start. Uh, it could actually have been a really good start of the magazine. If it had been turned around and the call for criticality had been featured up front. That would also make for a good start for a future Nordic ag Mart magazine if and when that should become a possibility. Thank you.